Okay, all right. All right, uh, welcome everybody. We're about to start our Bible study, and we are going to be talking about the issue of the heart. We will talk about our soul, and the part of the soul is the heart, or the center of our soul, or our inner being is the heart, and we'll talk about mainly about the heart, even though soul comp- you know, it's comprised of um, our mind, it is, of course, our emotional makeup, uh, it is the heart, and so we'll focus on the heart in this lesson. So let's pray. Father, we, we, we thank you, God, and uh, we invite the presence of your Holy Spirit, the teacher. We are the students, you are the teacher, Holy Spirit. Teach us the words of God, teach us the scriptures, the gospel. In the name of Jesus, we love you, Jesus. We love the way you teach. You are a beautiful teacher. Thank you. Inspire my heart, God, to say the words of the Lord according to the scriptures. Amen and amen. All right, the issue of the heart. Now, as I mentioned, our heart is the center of our soul. Now, our soul, how do we know that? Let's just say, we know that we are comprised of spirit, soul, and body. Now, the spirit is, of course, is our spiritual body. It comes from God. That's the place where God lives. You cannot share your spirit with anybody. It belongs to God. The soul belongs to us. It is our character. Um, it's what makes us us as personalities. And it's made up out of, uh, there's an emotional compound to that. There's, you know, we feel emotions and of course we can perceive that, that we have that. So we know we cannot feel our spirit, but we can, we know we have a soul because we can feel. Um, and then there's will, which is an important part of our soul. Uh, the will is what helps us to make firm decisions, okay? Because we, the will doesn't decide. It just makes those decisions firm. So when you look at the person with a weak will, uh, he, he battles in his heart, like, should I do it, should I not do it? And if the will is weak, he, he, he is more prone to falling into different things because of weak will person. Um, then we know there is conscience. Now, conscience is, again, it's part of our soul. It's um, by God given to us to help us discern what is good and what is bad. In fact, every person, people that don't even know God, if you go to different cultures, they still know stealing is wrong. They still know killing people is wrong. Um, why? Well, how do they know that? How do they know those things? Well, because of their conscience, where it tells them, it judges them. They, they don't feel good inside if they do something. Now, how do people get around that? Well, of course, we can have a seared conscience, which is where you train your conscience to, or, you, or, you, or your belief set trains your conscience that, that what you're doing is right. And then you lose that capacity of that, of that, of that function of, of conscience to tell you what is, what is wrong and what is right. For instance, I mean, if you convince yourself, uh, let's say you're just a funny story. Maybe you grew up, uh, um, you know, in those islands where, where people eat people, you know, cannibals, um, aborigines, whatever, the, the tribe. Now, if somebody grows up in that environment and, and they see, you know, this going on and their conscience will, be, uh, will not be judging them. Why? Because it's part of their belief sets, right? So they might get... Uh, uh, bothered if they don't eat somebody. It's, it's like the opposite. So conscience, so seared conscience means it's defiled. So one of the things when we come to God, He cleanses our conscience. It's a very important part of our soul. And then there's heart. Now the heart is the center of our soul. Now all of the decisions are made in your heart. All of the deep thinking is in your heart. Your imaginations, pictures, movies you play are part of your heart. Now, um, we're going to be focusing on that. Now, all decisions are made there. That's a very important to know because, uh, you know, in our mind, which is, if you want to think of a computer that receives information, okay? Our mind always receives information. Now, our heart really decides or chooses information on what to think, uh, what to see inwardly, so you can have different thoughts, but they're just like seeds. They're just, they're just there. You see something, 
you know, you get, you get an image, you get, or, or you hear something, you, you, you decide in your heart if you're going to think about it or if you're going to see it with your inner eye. Now that's, that's part of your heart. So, you, so your will helps you to make it, you know what, I'm not going to think about that. That's wrong. Okay? It stops right there. It doesn't go into your heart, produces nothing. Because in your heart is the soil where it produces. It has to get into the heart. The seed has to fall there. Its seeds are thoughts and words and images. So whatever you see, whatever you hear, whatever you say. Okay, those are seeds. They have to fall into the heart. They will only grow there. So Jesus talks about the soils, of the different types of soils, speaking of the human heart. That's exactly that. The seed has to fall there. Any type of seed. It would always produce fruit according to its kind. Okay? Whatever type of seed. If you plant it in your heart through imaginations, thinking about it, picturing it, that type of harvest you will reap. And it's all, usually you reap it more than just a seed. It's a 30, 60 to 100 fold things we reap. For instance, uh, Jesus says that, um, you know, it's... In Matthew, he, he says, if, if you look at the woman, right, and you lust after her, well, what does that mean? That when you look at her, you lust, and it's already as if you have committed adultery. Well, literally, if you picture her in your heart, it's only a matter of time and space. But whatever you see in your heart, you will do. It will happen to you. So, so in the beginning, decision of the heart is already sin because it's just a matter of time before it becomes your, rea your reality. And if you don't stop there, if you don't quickly repent of that, you know, these thoughts will keep coming back to you because there's a seed already and, and you're always going to gravitate into those images, into those thoughts if you don't repent and destroy the seed by renouncing it. And that's it's a different topic on uh, spiritual warfare, but we're talking about the heart. So all decisions are made there. You're judged. Uh, the Word of God judges your heart. Your, it, it judges your hearts, intents of your hearts. It, it judges that. And we answer for the decisions we make in our heart. If you get a bad thought, it's just a thought. Until you put it in your heart, it becomes a sin. God judges the heart. He always looks at the heart, intentions of the heart. The Word of God is, you know, it's, it's, it's living, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, it pierces, it, it goes deep into the heart, and it really sees everything, our, you know, what our true decisions that we make are, why we do things, why we say things, it goes through all of that to really expose our, uh, our heart. Now, God judges intent of our hearts, it's important to know, because out of the heart, of course, uh, things come out. Uh, into our lives. And the heart is the place where faith is produced. Uh, faith, you only can have the capacity to believe that will produce fruit is in the heart. It's the only place you can take things from the supernatural realms and bring it down to the natural realm. It's through the medium of faith and the heart, we believe with our hearts. Right? To be saved, you have to believe with your heart. It's a, don't, you can... Believing with your mind, is, it's just knowledge. It's, it produces nothing. You have to put it down there. There it will produce, in your heart. So, that's why the Bible's clear that, that the Word of God would not depart your mouth, meaning you, you, you quote scriptures, you read it out loud. Why? Because faith comes by hearing. Well, that's how you drop seeds into your heart. And the you know, hearing comes from the Word of God. So, you put scriptures into your heart. Well, what are you going to produce? Righteousness, whatever you are quoting, whatever you are, because you become, you, you start believing that, and that becomes your lifestyle. So, so good seed is good to plant. So that's why we not only read our Bibles, we declare or speak out scriptures. Very important because they're seeds. We think or meditate on them. Why? Because they're seeds. We plant them in the heart, and they bring harvest in our life of righteousness. So faith is in our hearts. And that's where things are produced, where we take from the unseen realms and bring it down to our own realities. All right. So deep love is in the heart. Another thing, deep love is always in the heart. 
when we love deeply, I mean, we can love at the, on an emotional level. There is that. I mean, we can, uh, but real love is always at the heart level. Deep love, it only is there. And I said, thoughts and words are seeds that we plant in our hearts. And it's like soil. And um, Proverbs 4.23, let's read that. Uh, it says, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. So your lifestyle, or, or what, you're, what you're living, or what it looks like, is the direct result of your imaginations and your thought patterns. In your words. That's your lifestyle. I mean, if you look at somebody's life, judging by what you see, but the fruit of their life, you can really tell what they meditate on, what kind of pictures they see in, with their inner eye, and what they say or what they he listen to. The two will we'll drop seeds down because they're words. So if somebody is, you know, in, you know doing things, whatever that's, you know, that, that are wrong, obviously wrong, you can tell where it's coming from. It's coming from the heart, all right? Again, it's his thoughts, his words, and his fantasies or, or pictures. Determined where the life is flowing, issues of life. That's same thing with righteousness. You see a person that is, you know, full of the presence of the Lord, full of God, all of those things, you can at least by observation know that, he probably reads the Bible, you know, he probably prays, he probably knows God at some level. Why? Because of the fruit. You kind of start guessing that, okay, he has to be planting seed, and his lifestyle is produced in that way. Uh, things that come out of our heart that defile us. Now, Jesus, in Mark 7, 21, I'm going to read that, that scripture. He really just explains it probably better than, than I could ever explain it. So he says, uh, just to set up the, uh, this scripture, Mark 7, 21, right before that, the issue was this, that, that the Pharisees saw that his disciples were eating bread or food with unclean hands. So they didn't go and wash their hands with soap, let's put it in, in our language. Because of their traditions, they would wash things, benches, they would wash chairs, tables, make sure things clean, they would purify everything with water. Again, they, and it's... It's what they did. And so when they saw disciples eating with, without that ritualistic washing of hands, they, they said, what are they doing? They are defiling themselves. So Jesus says, no, that does not defile you. But he says, I'll tell you what defiles a person. So we go to 721. He says, from, for from within, again, it's inside of us, out of the heart. It's the center of us, of our soul. Out of heart of man, proceed. So it comes out. First, evil thoughts. So again, we're thinking with what? Our hearts. We get information in our brain. But we think with our heart. And the Bible says that the fool thought in his heart there is no God. Not in his head. In his heart. It's conviction. It's belief set. So evil thoughts. So we think with our hearts. Adulteries. Fan it's fantasies that we play out in our hearts pictures that we draw, words we say, things we watch and hear, fornication, same, murders, absolutely same, you're going to watch a lot of movies with, with bloodshed and, and you see a lot of bloodshed uh, and you think about that and, and you, then people are, are not surprised when that happens in your life, when you know, murders happen. They don't just happen just suddenly. It's like, you know what, I'm, trying, I'm going to kill somebody. It doesn't happen that way. It's a process. You have to plant that stuff in your heart for it to become reality. So thefts, that's another one. Covetousness, wickedness, deceit, deception comes out of the heart. Lewdness, out of the heart. An evil eye, out of the heart. Blasphemy, out of the heart. Pride, out of the heart foolishness out of the heart nothing out of the mind <laughs> nothing out of the mind like so where is our mind what is our mind mind is the computer it receives information good or bad it is the gate into our heart our eyes our ears our senses our perception smells those are the gates where into the heart where decisions made in the heart we decide 
every day, every little decision, we just don't think about that, but everything you do, you decide on the subconscious level. You get up, you, I mean, you, you, everything is decisions. I mean, where you go, what you do, what you eat, all those things, you decide subconsciously a lot of those. You just do it like automatically, but th there are still decisions. You do them. It's out of the heart. Now, as I spoke earlier, that visualization produces life's circumstances, and it manifests in our lives. For instance, I'm just going to give you like a, 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 a story. For instance, um, let's say um, a young man or a, or a young gal that, um, you know, they, they, they listen to these, to these stars, you know, these pop stars or uh, who's, who's famous now. Um, uh, just pick, pick somebody. Taylor Swift. <laughs> All right, Taylor Swift. All right, let's pick her. So they, they're like, oh, man, I, she's so amazing. So, they po so what they do, they buy posters. They put posters in their room, right? They watch, they listen to the music. They, like, imagine all oh, concerts. If she could only talk to me. They, they, they imagine themselves around her, like, like she knows, whatever, whatever the fantasy is. Then you start looking at that person, and the first thing you start noticing how they change it because we become what we behold with our inner eyes. So the hair changes, we start dressing the same, we start acting the same, we are a copy, becoming a copy of what we're beholding in our inner man. Okay? So you can look like, a, you, you know the fan, I mean, <laughs> he looks, he dresses like one, he looks like one, his hairstyle is the same, all of those things. And then, interesting enough, if they pers pursue that, they will have that time and space where they will meet her or something will happen where they will be like her, whatever their imaginations were, if they're consistent, whatever they planned, and then that's become. If you ask anybody that became famous, it's like, well, how did you even, even think about these things? Well, they had somebody else that they looked up. They wanted to be like somebody else, and then they got fame just like what they imagined in their inner hearts. And it's good or bad. Same thing, like if a, if a, if a young man wants a, likes a car, let's say a, a red Corvette, and it's just, he just dreams about it, puts posters on it, dreams about or sees himself driving it, then there comes time and space where he actually gets it. Our circumstances align. Money comes in, things come in, and before not, he's driving the same car that he saw in his inner man. And people ask, like, and they will tell us, yeah, this was my dream car. This was my dream house. Well, what does that mean? That means they were dreaming about it for so long until it happened. So they say, this was my dream, this, this, or that. Why? Well, how, why, why do they say that? Because they actually saw that in their inner man. From unseen spiritual realms, they brought it down into the natural experience. Right? New Age teaches that principle, so you know. Um, it's very similar they, they plaster things on the walls. They, they have these tapes playing the same thing over and over. Why? Because it's, a, because it's a spiritual reality. They know it, and they use it to get rich, wealth, whatever, uh, whatever they want. Because they understand that spiritual law. Simply. I mean, it works for good or bad. So I kind of explained it a little bit. Um, now, the Bible is very clear. Paul actually says it. We must cast down vain imaginations because they will manifest. So part of spiritual warfare is actually casting down vain imagination. Well, what is vain imagination? It is imagination that is not aligned with the will or purposes of God. If your imaginations do not align with the will or purposes of God, they are vain. They will lead you astray. They will lead you astray. So what do we do? We imagine happy children. We imagine ourselves praying. We imagine ourselves preaching. We imagine ourselves serving God. We imagine ourselves talking to Jesus. We imagine ourselves going to heaven. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're planting good seeds. And guess what? Every time you hear about heaven, you start weeping. Every time you hear about Jesus, you, why? Because you carry these images. Now, if you go back to, uh, to the law of Moses, 
Well, well the first commandment is what? Not to have gods before me and to make an image. Well, yeah, why? Because we become what we behold. So idols are actually images in our hearts. That's it. So to remedy that, so we don't have idols in our heart, there is the first commandment, to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. You love God. You focus your inner eye on God and His Word. You are going to love Him. There will be no room for other images if you cast down vain imaginations. So, all right, let's go. Oh, that's Hebrews 11.1. 1. Um, it kind of explains it in a biblical language, what I just said. It says, Now faith is the substance of the things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the hope, you want it, is the evidence. It, it happens. You don't see it yet, but you see it within yourself. And then it manifests. So you are waiting for it to manifest. You are so sure it's going to happen. Well, that's faith. Assurance. You're sure this is going to happen. I am going to be doing this. I am going to you know, go big. I am going to... Whatever people say. Where is it coming from? It's faith. They believe it. They see themselves that and they become that. All right. Now, demons, they energize darkness in our hearts. So, speaking of the demonic now and their influences and how they, how they operate... So, so demons, they um, you know, need agreement with sin at heart level to enter. People think that, that just by walking around, uh, devils will just kind of attach themselves to them. I mean, they always need an open door. Now, your will is an organ, part of your soul, that will resist demonic infestation. Or, if, you, if somebody already got demonized, they can use their will to push them down. So the demon has to overpower or paralyze the will of a, of, of a human soul to control him. Okay, well, how does it look like? Well, if they enter a person, let's say somebody opens a door, um, like uh, to alcohol, right? Opens the door, drinks, 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 drinks. It's an open door. It gives uh, a, a demon, uh, a spirit of alcohol, legal rights, through the sinful behavior, consistently they, they come into the person and now now the person likes to drink it's the issue of the heart so they love that feeling you know, to escape from whatever whatever why they do it is because they love it i mean that's why it's hard to work with alcoholics because they love alcohol it's just they medicate they love it i mean it's you, you're you're dealing mostly with the love for alcohol versus this, the, the you know the bad things that it brings it's the love that is hard to break well so the demon comes in and there's an agreement. How does the agreement look like uh, with a person, um, let's say, spirit of alcohol? What, what does it look like? Well, it looks like this. When you challenge somebody, hey, you know, you, uh, I don't think drinking is good for you. They will bring up a scripture. Well, Jesus drank wine. Well, it's for my stomach. Well, it has health benefits. Do you see the agreement there? Yeah? It's always finding all these things to say that it's okay. Why do they do that? Because they are agreement. They're, they're in agreement. Now, to break free from that, you have to break agreement at the heart level. And that's where it's hard during prayer for deliverance. It's, it's the demons hold on because of that agreement. And a few times the demon even told me, in specific cases, we're praying for people. They just said, that person loves me and they cannot live without me. Watch me, I'll come back. Sure enough, they know the person really well. They live there inside of them. And that's exactly what happened. So agreements at the heart level. So the demons, they energize the sinful things that we allow in our hearts. They bring supernatural energy. Now, they have to paralyze the will. Now, how do you know they paralyze the will of the person? It's the area the person lost control. Somebody has no issue with alcohol has no issue with drugs, issue with immorality. So their willpower, so there's no demonic 
energy and any of those things because there's no demon there. They, they just resist it with their will and they're fine, but they can't stop doing something else. One area, they just cannot overcome it. Why? Because their will was paralyzed through the demonic spirit by the function of, if it's alcohol, it's alcohol. If it's immorality, it's immorality. It could be one function, it could be two, it could be three different. And so until you cast out the demon, you will not regain the control with your will over that spirit. When it comes out, tries to get back in, you just resist them. And, and, and you can because your will is free from that uh, supernatural influence. Again, they work with, 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 our, with our heart, with the, with the things that come out of our heart, our sinful issues, immorality. Uh, just fantasize about immorality and that opens the door to a demon of lust. It opens the door. It goes, boom, comes in, and then you just can't. It's all you do. You, they help you think about it. They help you. They energize. They heighten the experience for you. A lot of times, people don't want to get rid of the, of the spirit of immorality because they heighten the experience, and they have an agreement with demonic entity because of that, because they like the high. They like what, how they feel. And when you start praying for a person, some people have a hard time breaking agreements because they like, they don't like the conflict, they don't like the torment, they don't like the negative that comes with it, but they do like what the demon gives them ability, supernatural ability to, or enhances their experience. So that is why um, it is important. It's the issue of the heart. Demons agree or you agree with them with a specific sinful behavior and they put energy on it, and then your will gets paralyzed in that area that you have gave access to the demon. Mm -hmm. And, of course, deliverance is repentance, breaking agreements, and tell him, telling the devil to leave you alone, to, to get out. You have to tell him to, to, to go, so he would leave you. All right. Um, uh, demons identify themselves by function. Well, what does that mean? That means oh, their name usually is defined by what they do, what they energize, their function. So, um, like if people eat and, and overeat, and, and there's a demonic influence to that, well, that's a demon of gluttony. You can call them out by the function. Thieving, people just steal, and they're really good at that. People that have a spirit of theft in them, they're professional thieves. How, how do they get that good? That's their supernatural ability to steal. Right? So they need that. If they lose that spirit, they can't steal, they'll get caught. So people understand at a subconscious level, they understand that they have this ability to do that and get away with it. Well, how? It's a demonic spirit. And of course, it will be the spirit of theft. Because the function is that. Uh, it could be murder, could, whatever. Whatever. It, you know. So, uh, so you identify the demonic influence or the spirit that is energizing the works of the flesh by the function. It's, it's the area where you, can, where you feel like you're always hit with the same place all the time. You understand that, that there's, there's something going on there where your will cannot overcome it. Um, and you know the type of spirit by the fruit of, of it, or what is it? What are your thoughts? What do you feel? What do you see with your inner man? And you can say, okay, I'm seeing death. I'm seeing myself like crashing your car all the time. Well, the spirit of death, immediately. You can recognize him. The function, because the thought patterns are like that. People are afraid to die. They think they're going to die, or a loved one's going to die, or their husband's going to crash, or their kid's going to die somewhere, whatever. You, 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 you listen to the person, and you understand, okay, they have fear of death, spirit of death. So that's, you identify the spirit by the function. And you have to find the open door, how did he come in? So you ask questions, and when did it start? Um, so, uh, I remember one person said, um, Somebody, when they were smaller, uh, like, like kids, they threw them in the water, trying to teach them to swim. This one lady I prayed, and, and she was, got so scared, trying to, you know, trying to... That's how they did in Russia, so uh, that's how they taught me how to swim. They just throw you in the water and just kind of watch you, you know, trying to make it. But she said when she got, was thrown in the water, and she forgot about that. And she was you know, drowning, and she got so scared, and the demon entered of fear. So she's a Christian, she's a leader in the church, and she still battles, like either she's going to die or her love is going to die, like it's the same thought pattern. So we have to go back 
and get healing from that and expel that spirit that was affecting her mind and her heart. So that's kind of that. And um, uh, demons will try to weaken our will to get more ground. That is so true. So one devil opens the door for another devil. Well, uh, how do you weaken your will? Drugs and alcohol. The easiest way is where, when, there's your, when, when do you make the worst uh, decisions? Well, when you are not sober, when your willpower is down. That's why the devil likes to throw parties to entice young people so their willpower will be inhibited and they will find an open door to enter. So a lot of people get demonized at those parties. That's why the devils like them, because it's easy to catch people like that. They come in, they get them drunk, they do certain things that they're not supposed to do because they're not, they can't. They cannot discern anymore. Their willpower is down. And then they wake up and they're already demonized with whatever whatever doors they opened. So, uh, of course, alcohol and drugs will weaken your will. Not only through repentance and breaking of our agreements. At the heart level, we can cast their influence off. Repentance. Repentance, repentance. Now, what does repentance do? It takes out their legal ground to be there. Okay? So they can only be there because of, of um, you gave them place through sinful behavior. So the only way you can, um, th you can cast them out, because they're not going to leave, um, because they know their rights, is through repentance for specific things. Now, to get born again, we repent. It's a general repentance of rebellion that we would serve the devil and we were doing his will. We repent and we turn to God. We get saved. That's repentance unto salvation. We repent for the original sin of rebellion and pride. But then we start, when we get born again, we start working with the things that actually afflict us. It could be drunkenness, it could be different things. And so then we repent for those specific things to cast out the, the demonic root that, or infestation to take out the legal grounds why he's there. So let's say somebody repents, gets born again, but they still have issue with, with drugs or alcohol. They have issues with like, maybe thieving, maybe, maybe saying bad words, blasphemy or cursing or whatever. So they understand they have a problem, but they love God. They're born again. Their spirit is alive to God. They, they, they don't want to do that, but it just, it just happens to them. They, they have their willpower. They, they cannot you know, control that within themselves. So, they, so that they understand there's something stronger in them that is causing them to act a certain way. Well, so once you recognize the functions and you know your problems, you start repenting and closing the doors. And then you start breaking agreements with them at the heart level. Said, I don't want you anymore. Be gone from me. I don't agree with you. I break my agreements with you. My oath, whatever, whatever. I don't want you anymore. And then you have to cast them out. You have to tell them to leave. They're not going to leave unless you tell them. And sometimes it takes uh, an extra person to pray with you and help you, depending on, on the level of infestation, on the level of control that they have over a person. Uh, some people, they can't even pray for themselves anymore. They're just so bound. So that, so that there needs to be a ministry or people that come around and then they help the person walk him through repentance. Nothing really changes. You just help the person say the right things. Okay, repeat after me. Kind of guide them through it because they're not capable because the level of demonic influence that's in their, in their soul, it, some people just can't even say the words. I mean, we were going word by word, syllable by syllable. Just to say, I repent, could, could take a minute, because they would shut their mouth. It's, it, yeah. And so, because if they repent, the legal ground goes away. They have no rights to be there. And then when you break the agreement, and then the person says, I don't want you anymore, be gone from me. And then there's people praying, agreeing with you. Well, when there's two or three people praying for you, it's, it's a grace, it's a multiplier of grace. That's why when there's a group of people praying, things happen faster. And so um, you can pray for yourself, yes, but in some instances you do need help. Somebody to come alongside, agree with you, and help you walk through the, through the process. Uh, blaming the devil for our sinful behavior only exposes our agreement with them. The devil made me do it, right? Um, well, yeah, I mean, he influenced your um, desire 
or he energized but the problem is still the core is still at your heart if at the uh, when we stand before God um, you can't say you know the serpent made me do it <laughs> um, or the devil made me do it God says it was your decision there was influence yes um, but it was ultimately your decision your agreement with that and and we are judged based on that our agreement it's the sin happens in the heart before it manifests in our in our life in our actions so um, some people blame things on the devil but it only exposes their agreements because then there's really like if they're in the pattern they're like you know what you know I, I, I can't do anything about it the devil it's a, and they always frame it it's kind of interesting a lot of people frame it in that they're like under spiritual attack and like the devil's after them that's why he's causing them to fall because they're so amazing um, uh, we're not amazing we're not amazing we're we are uh, we need God at the deepest level I'll tell you that uh, we're not that great right so to kind of think yeah, the devil's after me because I'm so amazing God's going to use me it's deception we need to break agreements we need to say no this is not right I don't want to live like this anymore God get this out of me I don't want this anymore and then guess what? God will do that. I heard a person say, we, we keep what we love. And that's kind of true. I, I would agree with that statement. At the, at the deepest levels. Uh, within our mind, we say, well, it's kind of wrong. But it's at the heart level. Like, ah, I like it. That's the problem. We can agree with the Bible in our mind. But in our heart, we love it. And we, we hang on to those things. Uh, unforgiveness, bitterness. It's not in your mind. The mind is just receives information it's at the heart level we can forgive in our mind so yeah you know what Bible says I forgive but not in the heart changes nothing but when we forgive in our heart through repentance well then we we, we, we break free from that and, and our life changes so a lot of people know uh, Bible with their minds like as they, they can they can go to school they can actually study the Bible they can know you know a lot of it pretty well uh, they can go to school but if it's not at the heart level it's powerless in their life they cannot live a godly lifestyle because it's not mixed with faith so the word of God you can hear it in Hebrews it says they heard it oh, everybody heard it but only few were came out of, came out of uh, the, the, the wilderness why because the word they heard was never mixed with faith well, where does the, the Word of God that we consume mixes with faith? Where is faith? Well, it's in our heart. We have to let the seed go down to the heart. Meditate on it. You know, believe it. And then it produces life. And that's a saving faith. Uh, we can believe for great things, for sure. The um, Bible is full of promises of, of wealth, promises of health, promises of good life, uh, happiness, blessings. They're all there. Deuteronomy 28 is all for us. It belongs to us. But we never say them. We never pray them out. We never put our name to them. We think it's for somebody else you know, to be blessed in our house, be blessed in, at our job, be blessed in our marriage, be blessed in you know, our, our bank accounts to be blessed. You know, we're embarrassed to say that. Why? It's, it's God gave the word. It's there. The blessings of the law belong to us, to Christ Jesus. Through sonship. It's ours. We just don't take it. We don't take the things that God has given us freely. Why? Because in our mind we think it's, you know, we're maybe supposed to be poor. Maybe it's, you know, it's religious mindset. God says, no, I want you to be blessed and prosper in all things. That's God's heart. Uh, poverty mindset is a religious spirit, so you know. And um, a lot of the monks, you know, they would, you know, wear that garb um, of, of but I, I think it's St. Augustine. I, I read it somewhere where, where the monk had these, and they had the more, ho the more holes you had in their garments, you know, the more holy they would, people would perceive them. And so I think he was, there was Augustine said, because uh, the monk said, you know, like, look at me, how, how, you know, how holy I am. He said, yeah, through, he said, through every hole, I see pride, like, beaming out, you know. <laughs> that is true. It's religion. We're so proud that we're so holy, right? Like we're like above everybody else. We're so amazing. Um, so 
So poverty mindset. I mean, there's some hard times we can go through, and I went through a season of hardship. We all go through that, but there are always a seasons. You don't live there. Like poverty is actually a stronghold in our mind and in our heart. People say it to themselves. They believe it. They'll never make it. It's always for somebody else. It's never for me. Yeah, that, and that's why they're there. Desires of our heart. It's, that's where faith is. And, and you have it in your life, the issues of life, according to what you believe. If you believe you're going to be poor, you're not going to be rich. If you believe you're going to be rich, you're going to be rich. It's as simple as that. And people even in this world understand concept of that. And um, they use it. Same thing with giving money. A lot of corporate uh, companies, big companies, why do they donate so much? Because they like people? No. A lot of them have agendas. They support agendas that are completely anti-biblical. But why do they tithe? Well, they give to charity because it's the law of sowing and reaping. They want their business to grow. So they give to the poor. Why? Because it's a spiritual law. They understand it. They don't love God. They don't like God. But they understand the spiritual law. So big corporations give a lot of money. Why? To get more. Because it's the blessing. Because when you give, you, re you have the capacity to receive more. So giving is another way uh, to, to enlarge your territory. So those are kind of things. Um, all right. Repentance can only happen at the, at the heart level when God convicts us. Conviction has to come. Now, repentance comes from the Holy Spirit. I, I, and that's my belief. Some people may say, well, I can decide when I can repent. I believe that uh, God convicts our hearts and gives us the ability to receive His Word that will save us or the Gospel that will, that will save us. There's a lot of people that hear the Word preached, but only few get saved. It's always like that. Apostles preach, not everybody gets saved. A lot, but not everybody. Why? Well, we don't know. They probably don't know because it's at the heart level. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. But those who get convicted by the Holy Spirit, repentance come, and they get born again. So, so when God convicts somebody at the service or, or, or we position ourselves at the prayer meeting, we just you know, show up at the prayer meeting, and like one of those prayer meetings, you feel God near to you, and he's, you feel like, okay, He's speaking to me now, and... Usually, a repentance, a deep repentance comes with tears. There's always regret. There's always emotions, very raw emotions. That's true repentance. Tears and just the rendering of the heart happens because God has just entered and convicted us. And we start seeing ourselves from the eyes of God. And we say, oh God, save me. I'm a wretched man or a woman. Um, so that's why I believe that repentance is a gift from the Holy Spirit. That when He comes, um, He gives us the ability to receive the Word of God that saves us. Because a lot of people hear the Bible, but very few get saved. Why? Again, it's the Holy Spirit moving on our heart to give us the capacity, the ability to receive the Word that will save us. And, and we get born again. So that kind of concludes... Um, I, uh, my little teaching on the on the heart, and again, I will recap a little bit. We are spirits that have a soul that live in a human body. So when you look at yourself in the mirror, it's your body. You live inside it. You're looking at your body. You are not looking at yourself. You are inside the shell. You're just looking at your body. Okay. Your soul is your personality. It has a mind, so you can think. Um, you can receive information. It has, uh, you know, emotional makeup. It has your conscience, will, heart, which is the center of your being. And then, of course, uh, there's you know, spirits, soul, and body, and that's how we are made the complete man in the image of God. So salvation is our spirits get saved instantly. We get born again. Our soul, which includes our heart our mind, and, and our emotions, uh, they get sanctified. It's a process that we all go through. Again, we can only go through the process of sanctification from the position of a born-again spirit. 
because we need supernatural power of light to come into our heart and soul and push out the darkness. It is a process through two main disciplines, Bible reading and praying. That's it. Talking to God and reading the Bible. Memorizing it, speaking it, quoting it, putting it all over the place, like, like in the Bible. Put it, you know, they would put them in their garments. You know. The Pharisees loved it, under, put it on their head. So just put it anywhere that you see the Word of God. It's a good seed. And that's how we get enlightened. What gets enlightened? Our heart. The eyes of our hearts open up and we start seeing our circumstances, like we're seeing our deficiencies, because light increases in our heart and our soul through Bible reading and praying, communing with God. So we'll conclude this and we'll pray. Father, we're just so thankful for your Holy Spirit. Jesus, we are so thankful that you have sent him to us, that he teaches us all things, God. You keep nothing from us, nothing hidden, Lord. You revealed it through your Holy Spirit. You give it to us freely if we ask, Lord. So I, so I thank you for that. I thank you for the Word of God, the living understanding. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus. Thank you. We love your Son, your wonderful, beautiful Son. So we thank you, Father God, that our lives are transformed and we belong to you. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.